Hello and welcome back to our module on dependability. So far we have seen how we can add bit level redundancy to avoid soft errors. Errors caused by some transient effects like cosmic rays or disturbances in the environment. Now the question is what do we do when, with permanent failures in hardware? Um, well, um, this mechanism may not protect us and using some kind of an error correction to protect from transient errors has a very high overhead. We generally use spare parts um, to say in our hardware that can take over from the failed part. This happens in memory chips as well, but it is deep inside the actually design of the memory chip so it's not adequate quite for this class but there is a really good example out there in the form of disk drives so disk drives uh, traditionally hard disk drives are mechanical devices and they do tend to fail we have seen that disk drives have some failure rate of a um, percent or two per year uh, nowadays uh, there may be valuable data stored on these drives. Um, generally, there are backups, but there is a fairly high cost of bringing back the backup um, from to, to restore the operation after a drive fails. So generally, there is a great idea developed at Berkeley by Randy Katz and Dave Patterson in trying to provide redundancy that is going to help with failing disks. It is called the RAID, which stands for Redundant Arrays of Inexpensive Disks. This inexpensive is in there, uh, fits well. Um, it applies to any disk, whether it's expensive or not. The idea was actually deployed um, as an alternative to really expensive or high reliability disks that can be replaced with an array of relatively cheap off-the-shelf disks. So uh, our data then will not be stored in just one disk, it'll be stored across multiple disks and um, one of the things, or one of the concepts that are typically used in, in storage arrays is that the files are striped across multiple disks. What does that mean? So if you have a big file Instead of writing everything to one disk, we are going to break it up into chunks and write it as a stripe across multiple disks. Remember, disks are slow, so if we can just write pieces of files to multiple disks in par parallel, we can speed up our operation. So redundancy here um, can be used to speed up the disk operation, but it is also there to prevent uh, from uh, the slowdowns, uh, disruption in service, um, if there is a failure. So it improves our availability. So the disk will still fail and the contents of um, the user files are still going to be reconstructed from the remaining disks in the array. Of course, there is an overhead. Uh, we are not using all the disks to store different users' data. We are using some of the disks as a source of redundancy. So let's like, take a look at a few traditional ways how this concept of RAID, of redundant array of inexpensive disks, have been used. There are different levels of RAID. Um, RAID 0 doesn't provide any redundancy. We're not going, not going to talk about that. Um, it is there just to speed up by providing uh, striping. RAID 1 is the first form of the redundant disk array. So essentially what we have there is that we keep two groups of disks. Um, as many as we have primary disks, that's how many um, backups we have. These are called recovery groups and essentially each of, of a disk, in the simplest case, we would just have one disk here and one um, in the other group, we would be mirroring the data from one disk to another. 
We simply have two copies of our data um, and that provides redundancy. Um, there are no real speed trade-offs uh, or you know, advantages or disadvantages here. I, I mean, there are some slight um, trade-offs that happen when these disks are not equal, when all the, one of them or some of them are slower than the others, while well, they may be limiting the speed. Um, and, um, but we don't really need to dive into that for now. Um, the, the point here is that the, these RAID 1 arrays are expensive. We have 100% overhead. For every disk that we need, we provide one additional disk as a backup. But we have seen that we really don't need to do that in, in, uh, in DRAM uh, error correction codes. So can we use the same or a similar concept to provide redundancy in disks? So of course we do. Uh, that's the concept of RAID 3 where we add the parity. So here is how it goes. We can have a few disks and then we would add a parity disk to that. Um, our data is going to be stored in these disks um, and you can envision it for now as you know single bit data, although this, this would be parity in the form of words in RAID 3. And uh, we are going to stripe our file across multiple disks. So we are going to save our data and if we are striping as a single bit, it's more closer to like a RAID 2 level, but in RAID 3 we can imagine that these are these bits are just representatives of words. And then we'll be providing parity in a separate disk. This parity here is computed in the same way how we have done uh, in the past. Um, if we have an even number of uh, bits in a word, then the parity bit is zero. It just basically maintains even parity there. So if a disk fails, then the parity is going to replace it. But we remember in, in, in DRAM, we couldn't actually do that. Our parity did not provide enough information to know where the error came from. Well, we here actually know what uh, where the error came from. Um, we know that the disk failed. We would have this additional information that one of the disks has failed and we know which disk has failed. So these parity bits are there to recover the information that is missing. So by knowing that this bit is zero, this bit is 1, and this one is 0, we'll know that the missing bit is also 0. All right, so that was RAID 3. RAID 4 is a variant of that. Um, it just provides higher input-output rate. So here is uh, how it looks like. So this is how we can view an array of five disks. So there are four disks that hold user data and the fifth disk holds parity. And we can see that these, these are perhaps in, um, increasing uh, logical disk addresses. So these are different um, sectors um, in the disk. So um, you can view it as insides of the five disks that are spinning. Now, um, RAID 4 supports higher rate I.O. Uh, and what does that mean? For example, we would like to do a um, read of small files from disks 0 and disk 5. So, you know, the, the file basically fits in one disk, so uh, we can essentially read them concurrently from uh, disks 0 and 5 um, at the same time. And for a large disk, for a large write, we can speed it up by striping across all of the disks. Okay, it does have one of the the the, the challenges of uh, RAID four is the fact that all the parity resides on one disk. So if you're trying to write a bunch of small files, that's going to be the bottleneck. Let's take a quick look at that. So here is our inspiration for RAID 5. If we are writing uh, 
two small files d0 and d5 we have to generate parity for each those two writes are going to happen concurrently and now the question is how do we generate the parity um, in order to generate the parity we'll need to know all the other data that forms that parity so we'll need to read all the other this so uh, possibly we can go ahead and read them and then repopulate the parity or the other way which is usually what is actually being done uh, in in rate controllers um, our Parity disk has the old sum, so we can perhaps just recalculate, you know, read that parity, update it with this data, and write it back. It's a straight linear algebra there. In either case, the bottleneck here for RAID 5 is that all the parity is being written to this disk. So we need to perhaps read the parity data update it and write it back and do that for multiple files concurrently. So generally that disk is going to be the bottleneck. Um, then comes the motivation for RAID 5. RAID 5 is a way to improve the throughput and maintain the parity. And the way how it is being done is by simply distributing parity across, interleaving parity across the entire array. So not the parity is not going to be just on our fifth drive, it is going to be spread over all of the drives. So if we are writing to disks uh, uh, D0 and D5 over here, we'll be writing on these two separate disks and we can do that concurrently. And since their parity checks are associated with disks 3 and 4, we can do that. We can proceed with that concurrently as well. Okay, that's essentially um, RAID in a nutshell. There are different other types of RAID that generally employ a couple of more, a few extra disks, but we are not going to cover them in this course. So, in conclusion, we have seen how does redundancy improve our dependability. Um, we can use that by using spatial redundancy, by employing extra hardware, extra hardware in the form of extra bits, extra checks, um, or by using temporal um, uh, um, redundancy by repeating the operation if it fails the first time. We have seen the definitions of reliability and availability, and we have seen a specific example how we use parity for single error detection. And then we have seen how we can employ Hamming codes with a distance of three to um, perform single error correction and with an additional bit perform um, double error detection. And then we have seen that RAID arrays are the way uh, to handle um, failing disk drives. It's an example how does extra hardware, extra disks, um, redundancy improve the availability of a system. If the disk drive fails, our system does not crash. And its performance actually is the system's performance is improved. It is not degraded by using uh, multiple drives. We have seen that there are different trade levels there are more of them out there in practice, but we got a reasonable good understanding of uh, how they work. Anyway, that's it. Um, this is all what we wanted to cover with respect to dependability, and that wraps up this module. See you later.